Welcome everybody, Digital Marketing Wednesday. Here we go again, buckle up. We got a, uh, an action-packed session for you today where we're gonna be talking about virtual open houses. Heck, we might even just be talking about plain old-fashioned open houses with a little virtual layer on it. Uh, we're gonna get into the importance of Facebook groups and a few tactics on using those. Uh, and then Ben's gonna dig in on uh, CRMs, uh, segmentation, and some of the best practices that we're seeing emerge from that. Uh, before we dig into that, Ben, what's uh, what's the status update there in Raleigh, North Carolina? Uh, it's, it's it's strange weather every day. So warm, cold, warm, cold. And then uh, real estate wise, the market is moving very rapidly. We're still seeing a pretty good, pretty solid market in Raleigh. Yeah, good, good. Glad to hear it. Well, down here, uh, we have 35,000 year round residents in the little beach town that I live in. And I think 34,000 of them were at Lowe's this weekend. Uh, so uh, maybe that's going on in your market as well. It is crazy to see how people have emerged from the woodwork. Uh, that's a, a topic for another day, though. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about open houses as you and I were preparing for this. Uh, for those of you who've been watching Digital Wednesday with us uh, since the beginning, this is now our sixth edition of this. Um, <clears throat> in the very early days of this, uh, we started talking about things that would stick on the other side. We started talking about implementing uh, digital techniques for some of the classic things that we did and Ben talked some about open houses. So we're gonna do a little refresher there and we're gonna dig way in the weeds on this because we really believe this is something that's got a lot of legs underneath it. So Ben, maybe get us started if you don't mind and I'm gonna stay in the screen here with you and we're just gonna lob this back and forth. Uh, talk a little bit about best practices of open houses in general before we go layer the virtual element to things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a great question, and I think one of the things that when you're thinking about this, as, as we're going to talk forward, something you, something you could put in your notes and kind of be noodling on is what was your open house procedure prior to the pandemic or you being quarantined? And then what we're going to do when we talk today about this is kind of go from that thing of this was my plan, my execution, my process from step one to step 1000, whatever it is. And what we're going to do is walk through and kind of look at what are the pieces that I can still do? And the thing with that, that we, Bill, you and I were chatting about is you can still do the majority of the things inside of that open house plan, except for physically having people in the house, right? That's the main thing that has changed. And he had to tweak some dials in there as well. Um, overall though, I, I, whenever we're talking open houses, uh, I, to borrow one of Bill's expressions, it's, it's like a 12 course meal, right? You can't just start taking one piece of the meal and that's the only thing you concentrate on, which is what a lot of agents do when they did open houses. They would just do the open house. They would do nothing else around it, just that singular event. And it's one of the big misses because the open house in itself is part of it, right? We do want to stay at a good open house and have a good time and have certain resources at the house, things to give people, things to ask people. Um, that is an important piece of it. The bigger pieces of it are all the work you do in the week leading up to the open house. So starting on a Monday, what's your marketing plan for that open house? Where are you posting it out on social media? Where are you announcing it at? Are you sending out neighborhood invitations? Are you doing a neighbors only invite for an hour prior to the actual open house? Are you circle prospecting on Tuesday? Are you calling at least 100, 200, 300 people in the area announcing the open house and inviting them to it? Um, and then Wednesday, Thursday, it goes and gets blasted on your social media accounts that this is coming on this day. Um, and then Friday, you're sending the rest of your materials and Saturday you have the open house and at the open house, do you have tools available to capture people's information? And again, this, this, this syncs well over to the digital world. So uh, you could have things that we've talked about before, Bill. I know we teach us on a lot of the, the, the seminars and panels we've done is looking at things like a wood sell list, creating a list of all the homes in your market that may be expired or new construction, or maybe they're withdrawn and you create a list of properties that would sell if they got the offer they were looking for. It's not sure. available on the, uh, the listing syndicates like Zillow or realtor.com. So that's a piece of information that's valuable to people looking for a home or visiting an open house. So having those type of tools at the open house and then uh, preparing all that information and then before the open house, are you calling the neighbors again? Um, uh, prior to the pandemic, maybe you were door knocking. So now maybe instead of you only called 200 people before, maybe you're calling 400 people now to tell them about the open house that you're doing. Um, things like that, that you can tweak that are still there. And then on the backside of the open house, after you have the names, 
are you following up with them that day? Not on Monday, if you do a Saturday open house or a Friday open house, are you calling them that afternoon, sending them information, sending them other houses in the area? Do you have a top 10 list? Um, uh, all of these pieces of, of the open house process, I think the big thing you have to step back and look at is saying, what pieces can I still use? You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because we can't go and show houses right now, or maybe you can't do an open house right now with people coming through it at a high level. You can still do all the other parts to promote it and capture information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're, you're throwing a lot of great thoughts and questions out there about the, the foundational elements of open houses. And, and to reiterate, folks, here's why we're having this discussion this way right now. Uh, you've likely seen it or maybe you've experienced it in your business where uh, we certainly see this with a lot of our clients where doing the virtual open house now has seen a massive amount of traction, hundreds, thousands of eyeballs virtually seeing the open house. And, and when you consider that real quickly, it's just a minimal amount of friction. Let's imagine that it's a Sunday afternoon at some point in the distant future, not even this Sunday, some point in the distant future. And somebody's sitting on the couch and they're snuggy scrolling social media and sees that you're doing a, a live virtual open house. <clears throat> What's the likelihood that they're going to get up, get out of their snuggy, get in their car, drive a few miles to your open house and, and happen to go through it in person versus the opportunity for them to just see it right there on their screen. And if they love what they see in the first few minutes, they stay and there's lead capture. And if they don't, then they don't. And either way, you're reaching hundreds, maybe thousands of eyeballs. So the reason we're really digging in on this today is to say this is one of those things that we feel really strongly is going to stick on the other side. And, and I imagine a day where you're simultaneously, and I know, Ben, you feel the same way about this, where you're simultaneously uh, holding sort of the old school open house where you've done all of the things that Ben's discussing and we're going to keep digging into today, and people are showing up in person. And simultaneously, you or someone on your team is interacting live with an audience across a platform like this, and you've got someone filming this, and they see actual humans walking around in the house, and they see uh, you know, people interacting, and they see these things that Ben's talking about, and you have this beautiful, I was going to say like the illusion of demand, and I don't even know that it's an illusion. It's, it's there is additional demand and almost infinite scale to what you're doing there. Uh, so this is one of those things that, that we really could not be more excited about than we are <clears throat> that has come from this. And as we talked about it, we were like, well, hey, maybe before we get into all the digital execution of all of this, maybe we ought to dig a little deeper on how well are we doing the old school open house before we start adding the virtual layer. So that's the spirit of this conversation. Uh, so Ben, if you were to, to say um, uh, the number one like favorite thing, you, you listed a lot of them. And if you were to say most impactful, like you absolutely must do this related to, I'm going to call it a traditional open house before we go talk about uh, digital. What's the one thing highest impact they must do in open house promo? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, well, you said Snuggy there and I felt personally attacked for a second because I you were calling me out. And I was like, it's true. If I was wearing a Snuggy, there's like a 50% chance I might go to an open house and not change. I don't know. But for a second there, right. I thought you caught me on camera. Uh, no, seriously, uh. <laughs> with an open house, I think the big thing that I would say, if you're done, anything else that you do is the promotion of the open house. And that means the work you do beforehand. Uh, one of the big reasons we typically get, you know, double digits number of people coming to open houses, 30, 40, 50 people typically, is that we do a lot of work beforehand to promote one. Um, and that goes back to, you can still call people, right? That, that's not a, that's that, that hasn't gone away. You can still pick a phone up and call people before the event. You can promote it at a high level. I think people miss the ability to promote this. They get kind of in a, in a one track mind of let's just put it on our business page our Facebook business page. And then we'll put it on the MLS and that'll syndicate out and that'll drive people to the open house, put some signs and balloons out and call it a day. You have a really big opportunity because you can remember what is the, what are we selling in real estate? Our one product that we have to sell is a house. So every time you get a piece of inventory to sell, you need to promote the heck out of it. You need to get in front of as many people as possible and let them know that you, the agent or your team are the people that have the houses or the inventory that people are looking for. So calling people, I think is a very undervalued thing right now. People are starting to come out of that fear state that we, that we were in throughout April 
and you could really call on both sides of this. I'm seeing a lot of opportunity around circle prospecting. So picking a phone up, just letting them know. And the conversations we're having right now, it's, it's, it's comical to say when you say it out loud, but it's really the real conversations are, I didn't know real estate was still selling. Or they'll say, I didn't know it was a good time to sell a home. And then you can go back with if your home sells quickly, you got a lot of offers, a lot of whatever the su success stats of that home are. You can say we had this many showings, we had this many <clears throat> offers, we did this virtual open house, and it got 1,700 views. Whatever the numbers are that you want to put out there, you can tell them and and portray to them that there is interest in the market. So on both sides of the open house, I would say promotion, uh, letting people know, and then after it's over. I think people kind of retract and they think I'm just going to call the people that came to the open house, call everybody else too. call all the people in the neighborhood say, Hey, I just want to let you know, we had a great open house. This many people came through. If you haven't know of anybody who's looking to buy or sell in this area, obviously there's a lot of interest. Um, right. I, I think that's a really underutilized way to, to leverage your lead gen opportunity. Again, I go back to, it's almost like a client event. I think client events or any type of event you do, I'm always thinking of how can we how can we bust this wide open as big as possible and get the word out there. Um, and with this, it's all about on the front end is promotion and on the back end, it's follow up and utilizing the product that you have. So if you have one listing, leverage that. Um, and then I, I go back to, I always think of, well, what if I don't have a listing? What if I'm a brand new agent and I have no listings? Go find an agent who has a listing and do it for them. I right. guarantee you there are people who don't, do not want to pick a phone up and do this. Go do it for them. And right. you'll see yourself turn business over. Um, we're stuffing our listing pipeline from this simple conversation right now because people don't know. All they hear is the negativity. So when you bring positivity to them on both sides of this, huge opportunity for you to build out a really strong pipeline. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm off my soapbox. So uh, no, it's good. No, I wanted us on the soapbox right now because it's such an important topic. And it, it's coming up a lot because people are thinking about what does my business look like when this quote gets back to normal? So one thing I, I'd encourage you guys to be mindful of in your phraseology, and if, if you read the newsletter I sent out on Monday, you saw this, is uh, we're talking about moving to the new normal, which happens anytime there's a change in market dynamics. This is not unique to this time. The, the thought that we would somehow revert back to the way things were three or four months ago is a trap. And it's a trap that most of your competitors are going to fall in. So just take this topic of open houses as an example. Um, the agent who's not thinking about the new normal, the agent who's not thinking about the digital competitive advantage that comes from this says, I'm going to go back to doing open houses the way I've always done them because it worked then. And then I'd like for you to imagine that a seller interviews that agent and a seller interviews you, and you show up with choices, you show up with options, which is always the easiest way to close people. And, and you say to the seller, in this micro example, as part of this, uh, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, we have three options on how we do open houses. We have traditional or old school. We have new school, which is virtual, which we're about to talk about. And then we can do both at the same time. And let me show you how we've done that before. And just in that area, you're going to blow the competition out of the water. Now, there's a zillion other examples. We're just talking about this one today. Let me give you my one thing on old school open house that also applies on virtual. And then I'm going to hand it to Ben to talk about the virtual execution. If you did nothing else on the back end of your open house, except follow up immediately after the open house. Ben touched on this briefly just a second ago. We see it all the time where somebody will do an open house from like two to four on Sunday and then uh, like Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, start following up with leads from the open house. And, and I'd like for you to consider you're always competing for someone's attention. You're always competing for their brain space. If they were at your open house in person or, or virtually at two o'clock in the afternoon, well, at four o'clock that afternoon or eight o'clock that night when they're sitting on the couch watching TV, they're still thinking about real estate. They're not thinking about the widgets they have to go make on Monday. And as soon as they get back into the widget factory on Monday, they're thinking about widgets, not thinking about open houses. So we'd love to see you block an hour, two hours, the rest of the business day, whatever it is, immediately following your open house to do follow-up. So on the front end, it's crush the promo. On the back end, it's immediate follow-up. And Ben talked to you about a lot of things in the middle. So uh, because this is not a full day session on uh, executing on open houses, Ben, let's take that and talk about execution in, in digital and virtual. How do I marry those? 
uh, give me the, the practical how to's on that. I'm, I'm going to step out of the screen and kind of let you run this play for a bit. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good look into when we look at open houses, how can we make this work? Right. Uh, and one of the big things I think that, as I said at the beginning of this, don't get stuck in that 12 course meal looking at one course of the entire meal. Uh, when we look at the whole spectrum of this thing, I, I really start on the front part of how are you capturing people's information and how, how are you going to um, be able to move them down a funnel at some point? How are you going to keep in touch with them? How are you getting uh, gathering information uh, in any in any event? And, and the way to do this, I'll tell you that off the bat, there are a lot of different ways to do this. So the simplest way and the free way is just setting up a Google form. Like if you really want to just execute on this today and like, I just want to do low calls, don't really want to think about it too much. Set up a simple Google form. If you have a Gmail or a G Suite, set up a way for them to sign up on that form. You can post a link for them and then it'll, you can have a thank you come up with a link to your business page for them to um, tune into the, uh, the Facebook Live or whatever you're doing to promote the house. Uh, from there, you could also do Facebook events. People can register for the event on Facebook. It costs you nothing and you still capture their information. Um, Eventbrite would be the next step um, in terms of the free and, and not super complicated way to do things. And this way you're capturing an email, um, you're, you're getting additional data on, on the people. And plus with, with Eventbrite, you can send reminders the events inside of Facebook can be sent up, set up to send them reminders about the event as well. Um, but beyond that, when you're talking lead capture, uh, you, you can also force them to a squeeze page. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some CRMs, different things there. A lot of them have built in pages on, on the IDX side of things that will, will squeeze or they call it squeeze or landing pages. So when a lead or person lands on the page, it'll ask them to register. You can build that out for your open houses. And if you're, and if you're with a bigger company like Abrivity, Boomtown, Commissions Inc., um, smile on those lines, uh, you can actually go and ask them to do this too. Most of the time they can help you set this up if you're unsure how to do it. It's pretty simple. You just create a page, have forced registration on that page, and then you can have like a picture of the house and then you can also uh, uh, have them sign up that way as well. And then that drops right into your database. So if you wanna add a layer of sophistication to it so that it's going into your database, you can do it that route. Um, and then single property websites, what's really cool, we use one called Rela HQ, R-E-L-A-H-Q, and um, they've actually created ways for us to stream our Facebook Lives or post virtual open houses on the pages. So they have that created, and you're seeing that with a lot of different landing page or single property website sources right now, where they're creating ways for you to gather people's data while uh, uh, promoting your open house. So on the front end, again, that's just some of the examples, figure out your lead capture, right? Pre-open house, what are you doing to capture those leads so that you can follow up with them, so that you can uh, 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 drip campaign stuff to them later on, send them additional information, remind them of the, of the open house. And then in the event they don't show up to the virtual open house, you can follow up with them afterwards, send them the video, send them information on the area, maybe send them uh, like a top 10 list of houses that are for sale for the area utilize the materials you're making or you would typically make for an open house in that context. Um, and then from there, uh, make sure you're promoting it everywhere. So when we first started today or at the top of the video, we started talking about different ways to promote a typical open house. I, and and I, like I said, I think a lot of people post it on a business page and maybe on the MLS and then hope it syndicates out. And then from there, they don't do much more to it. Um, post it on your social media, post it um, uh, uh, inside of your, uh, or send out to your database, you know, email to your entire database of people. If you're accruing inbound leads, whether they're Facebook leads, Google leads, Zillow, Realtors.com, wherever they're coming from, um, blast it out to them as well as an invite. Send the link to the, either the, the Facebook Live, if you have it staged with Premier, or have it as a, they get invited to a group to see it. However you're planning to do it, um, you can blast that out to them as well. And I'm really, I'm really big on making sure that whatever your pipeline looks like. So uh, if you have, say, 100 people in your pipeline right now for a big number, and you're looking at it, you're going, who are my top 100 leads that are active on my website? Or maybe they've, they've, they've met with you and they're six months to a year out. Um, we still like to send them this information, text it to them, send them a link to it so that they know uh, about the open house itself. So pre-open house, 
blast it everywhere, right? Don't get too concerned with how you're gathering data. I think that it's important to gather data. I think that's the main takeaway message if you write anything else down in your notes is figure out how you plan to capture people's data, right? Um, and the beautiful part of this is that much like when people go into a, uh, a open house, I've always heard uh, agents talk about how they couldn't get people to sign in. The beautiful part about this is that people actually have to sign in if you create a barrier for them to get into the uh, the actual video or the, the virtual uh, open house. So that's a good part of this. Now you're still gonna get some Daffy Ducks, which I actually had Angelina Jolie at one of my open houses at one point sign in. So that was kind of cool. I didn't know she was there, but someone signed in that way. Um, and, and, if you're, and if you're just tuning in, trust me, the jokes may get a little bit better later on. We're not sure about that though. Uh, and then uh, during the open house, the way to do the actual open house, we, I, know, I know people are getting kind of hung up on the execution of this. At the end of the day, you want to go virtual um, somewhere. And then three main platforms, three main platforms to do this on. Facebook's the big daddy, right? They're the ones who have been doing this the most and give you the most options of things to do, whether you broadcast it into one of your groups, you broadcast it on your Facebook page, you host a watch party on your um, on your personal page, they're the ones that give you the most options. You can also utilize Instagram or you can utilize YouTube. Um, overall though, don't get hung up on trying to get them all done at one time. If you had to pick one to do right now, Facebook is still ahead of the pack in terms of the quality it can, it can deliver as well as some of the tools that you can utilize inside of the live. Um, and then people are always asking, should we do it through a Zoom? Should I do it just through the Facebook app? That depends, right? Um, we've been testing out both. We haven't seen a huge difference between the two. We are starting to notice a little bit of, of bias on Facebook's part uh, towards uh, things created inside of their app. So they are showing that they prefer video being made natively to their platform. Um, and it makes sense because they don't really want to syndicate from other people or from outside sources. And I can tell you right now that they don't like YouTube because YouTube is Google, right? They're owned by Google. So those two butt heads a lot and they don't like each other. Um, they will kill any video you put on there. Uh, I think I was chatting with some agent earlier this week and we, we tried posting a YouTube link just to see what would happen. Um, it got not even a quarter of what another uh, Facebook Live got that we posted in terms of views and then engagement as well. So Facebook's very biased towards its own products inside of, 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 the, uh, of the platform. So however you decide to do it, again, take your camera, at the end of the day, that's what you need is a camera, DSLR camera, or you can just use your phone, right? And then the biggest thing I, I think I mentioned last week or the week before was just some type type of stabilizer for the for the phone, so it's not super herky jerky or shaky. If you don't have one of those, just go use just go use your phone. It's fine. Um, and then a headset or headphone or some type of audio device so that it's not just depending on the phone speaker. But overall, the execution of the open house is pretty standard. Um, there's not a lot of different ways to do a virtual open house. You can layer things in here. You could have multiple cameras, you can post into multiple accounts, all that kind of stuff. You can do a lot of things there. Um, you don't need to get that technical though if you just want to execute on doing a virtual open house. And then post open house. It's just it's just the the follow-up of all the new, whether it's your CRM, whether it's a just a simple form, whether it's an event or an Eventbrite, um, wherever it may be, uh, the, the big thing you want to make sure that you do is, is that you're um, having them somewhere that you can follow up with them. So uh, that's the big piece to keep an eye on there. And then uh, I, at the end of this, resend to your top 100 and, and make sure that this back in front of them and any leads that come in, follow up with them. Like I mentioned before, I, I'm not opposed to going out and following up with the rest of the neighborhood as well. So overall, that's that's kind of what we see on the Facebook side of, or, or on the open house side in terms of how to run this play. Um, Bill, anything else on your end you want to add or, or any questions we have? Well, I want to backfill with a question that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm monitoring uh, comments of folks who are watching this live. And uh, so this is about prospecting to the neighborhood. Um, touch quickly on how you go about getting numbers of people to do circle prospecting or phone prospecting around your open house. Uh, great question. So data sources you can use, it's, it's really dependent on the area. The best one in terms of quality that we have seen is Cole Realty Resource. Uh, they, they've just had the best numbers, the best email. They have emails too, so they, they've been pretty solid for us. 
Uh, you could use Red X. I know Mojo has data. Um, I think Land Voice has data. Their quality for us in our area was below subpar. It was like less than 10% accuracy. So um, uh, Cole Realty is around 40 to 45% accuracy in our area. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, and then the other question that was lumped in with that, which I, I think you touched on, however, reiterate it, please, is uh, uh, calling the database or prospecting to your MET database about the open house. So number one, are you doing that? Number two, uh, what's that that look like? Yeah, great question. So um, I, I definitely uh, advocate for telling your people that houses are still selling. So again, I take any opportunity for good news. Uh, we're always trying to find a way to put that out there. So we do call and let them know. Um, we text it and we'll email it as well. Uh, we don't do one per open house. So if you're a team and you have like five or seven open houses going on, we'll put that all in one email or we'll create a web page and say, here, go to this page, pick your open house you want to see. A little bit more nuance. If it's just a single open house, uh, I think it's fine to text, email people. But we'll call our top people and just be like, hey, we're just going to let you know that we have an open house, our house going on the market. We're doing a virtual open house. And right now, since it's new in our market, not a lot of people are doing it. We're like, we'd love for you to come let us know what you think about what we're doing. And what we're trying to do a little bit here is future paced our sellers that are in the crowd, right? We're trying to show them the technology that we're doing by saying, hey, just come taste it, come see it, tell us, give us some feedback on it. So we do the whole, the whole um, psychology trick there, just asking them for a favor so that down the road, when I go back to ask for business, my follow-up call into my database is simple too, guys. Because then I can say, hey, how was that virtual open house? What did you think about it? What can we do better? Um, tell, me, tell me what your favorite thing was, your least favorite thing was, so we can improve going forward when it's time to sell your home. Sure. Sure. It's a great point. Uh, so let's touch on one more thing related to the advertising of the virtual open house. And I know this is a rabbit hole that we could go down for like hours and hours. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask the question, let's kind of hit the 10,000 foot view uh, because you, you dedicated two entire sessions of your digital marketing course to, to this topic. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll set it up and then we'll transition into the next couple of topics we're going to hit. So I'm going to preface this by saying, um, and, and I'm going to rub some people the wrong way on this, and I love you, and you know that I do. I think the boost post button is the lamest button in all of advertising um, because uh, there's so much more that you can do uh, in the back end of Ads Manager in the promo of something like this. So, Ben, here's my question. Um, target audiences for promo of an open house either leading up to the virtual open house and or once the live event is over promo on the back end if you were to just sort of popcorn for us what the target audiences are and how you how you would pick them what would those be great question so uh oh, that's much my reminder my computer apologize uh the, right. the big thing on that is to think through who you're trying to target right so again, this is going to be dependent on the type of home, the area you're in, uh, that type of stuff, but just broad strokes, broad strokes on this. And the cool thing, and you're right, Bill, the, we, we can get in the weeds here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out of them. You can create a Facebook event and then create an ad that will get people interested in your Facebook event. And then from there, you can take your, the people that have interacted with your event and you can retarget them with materials from the actual open house, like the video the virtual open house video if they missed it or other things to drive them down your funnel even farther. So that's that's more, I would say like 3.0 stuff. So we won't dig into sure. that. Uh, broad strokes advertising side of things here. I would say you could definitely go on the back end. If you did a Facebook event, you can uh, create an ad around that event that'll drive people to interact with the event. And if I'm targeting people, um, we like to do layering inside of our targeting audiences. So we'll start with something very broad that we know a lot of people are interested in. So for example, um, some of the things you can target inside of the back end of ads manager is Zillow or realtor.com uh, because they have very big followings. And I know that a lot of home, uh, when people start their home searches, that's where they're gonna start at. They're gonna start on Zillow or realtor.com. So that's the top part of my funnel. And then from there, uh, because we used to be able to dig deeper into how we build out the audiences. Um, and now since there's some restrictions in place with the, the, the size of the radius and things of that, nature um, we can't exclude people or anything like that so what we'll do to narrow or refine our audience is start with that top layer of zillow realtor.com and then we'll hit narrow audience underneath that and then we'll build in 
homeowner interest. So for example, say your home is a for first time home buyer, you can target first time home buyers. You can target um, people who have recently uh, applied to get pre-qualified for a mortgage. So you can, you can do a lot of targeting based on behaviors um, in that style. That being said, if it's say a luxury property, um, we're still gonna start ZillowRealtor.com because here's the funny part about people who buy luxury properties, they still search online. They still look online for, for high-end houses, right? That's how it all starts for everybody these days. Um, and then what we'll do with that group is we're gonna layer in their lifestyle interests that they may be interested in, such as golf, right? If I know that there's a home in a golfing community that we're selling, um, we've, we've done this before, I think we talked about it in the digital marketing course, we're gonna layer in different pieces of that um, uh, to, to, to drive it in front of somebody who's not only looking on Zillow, they're also interested in golf because that's my ideal candidate or prospect that I wanna put this in front of. Um, and then after the event, I would, I would strongly advocate for retargeting, uh, anybody who is, you can retarget anybody who has, uh, uh, came into your event at all. If they expressed any interest, if they showed up, if they didn't show up, you can target on all of that, um, and retarget information back in front of them. So retargeting on the back end of an open house is absolutely critical. And one of the coolest things you can do to convert leads from your open houses. Absolutely. Uh, so one quick thought on that. I'll post in the comments after we're done with all of this. You can come back and look at it. A link to the digital marketing course that Ben, that, uh, ben created. He devoted an entire session to ads manager and an entire session to retargeting. So uh, this is not a class on that. This is a to tell you the opportunity that's there. Uh, and, and we have all seen that work on us. I bought some shoes the other day where I had clearly been retargeted multiple times with, with different pieces of content from this particular company. Um, and they just happened to catch me at a time where I had time to see it through to the end and pick out the ones I wanted. And uh, so it, it works. We all know it does. And, and there's a great way to do that. Uh, okay, so let's take that, Ben, and transition a little bit because we started talking briefly last week about groups. Uh, the people who are watching this are watching it in a group. Uh, Facebook has put a lot of additional emphasis on groups. So interested in your thoughts, and I'll step out of the screen so you can kind of teach the folks some more stuff. Uh, why groups? And then based on that, what should I be considering to kind of get started in that if I'm not there already? Yeah, great question. Uh, so groups, I think Facebook used the phrase uh, meaningful communities is what they're pushing now in terms of the social media aspect that they're going for on their platform. Um, so groups are important. And you can write this down in your notes because it improves the suggestions that Facebook makes to people. It improves the suggestions that Facebook makes to people. So whether you know it or not, if you're part of a group, um, on Facebook in a certain category. Let's just use real estate since most of us in here are real estate agents or run teams or some aspect um, of, of that. Uh, it's going to offer you content based on real estate more than anyone else who doesn't interact with real estate groups because you have shown an interest in that. And they're using a lot of the data pool from those groups to serve up meaningful suggestions. Now that's important because if you were to say, create a group on real estate in your community and people are in that group and you're interacting in there, it's gonna attract more people into that group organically. You won't have to pay for it. So what I want you to imagine is go back to Facebook in 2007, 2008, right? Um, if you can remember it, if you're on the platform at that time, it was just getting started. Businesses had a heyday and there was a big rupture in the platform um, 2010 and 11 when they started pushing the advertising side of the platform and they killed business pages because it, the first the first thing they did was have big companies come in, build presences on Facebook. All of that was organic traffic. They didn't have to pay for their followers. They didn't have to pay to put their advertisements in front of people. They were able to produce high level marketing materials, build funnels out organically, AKA for free. And when Facebook took that away, people got very upset about it. However, what they did was they introduced this ads manager that is now allowing us to put ads in front of people that based on all the data they've accrued over the years at a much lower cost. Groups is the new organic Facebook page. It, it's absolutely incredible the type of interaction you can get inside of a group. So if you're thinking about groups or how do I start a group or should I start a group? The answer is yes, you should. Uh, that, that's a simple one on this is, is um, and I think people get caught up in thinking they have to create a community group. So there's two types of groups, in my opinion. You have your internal and your external. 
And if this sounds familiar, it's because when I talk about processes, I think internal and external as well. So with your groups, internally, think database. If you have a database, they need to be in a Facebook group because they're spending time on the platform as it is. And if you're putting your content on that platform and they interact or they see things inside of your groups, they're going to get more of you in front of them without you having to pay for it, right? So organic traffic. So if you have um, a database and you want to cultivate that database as an additional layer to the other things you're doing, um, a, a Facebook group is an exceptional way to do that. The other, the external would be community groups. And community groups, uh, they can pretty much be anything in the world. And one of my favorite things I like to say to people is that all roads lead back to real estate at some point. Um, if people know that you're in real estate, they know that's what you do and you help people buy and sell homes, eventually in a conversation, they're going to ask you a question about real estate. So uh, I like to think of this in terms of our groups as well. So you don't have to create a uh, real estate centric group. Now, I'm not saying don't. I do advocate for that. Um, if there's not one in your area, go do it because they're really powerful tools um, and they, they can really uh, uh, grow your business for you. That being said, when, when you think of what type of community group should I create, uh, you really need to, th this is something one of my mentors told me at one point, was to uh, create content that I would enjoy reading. Create content that I would enjoy reading, meaning that if I didn't like to read it, then the other people I'm trying to add to that group wouldn't like to read it either, right? So you can really get very niched on this. And one thing you could do, for example, uh, and it does tie back to, to, let's just say you like to bike, right? So you like to bike, so you create a local bike group in your area. Um, and in that group, you're posting content about the best trails to go ride on. Maybe you're posting about um, the best places to stop on your ride while you're out. You become that local community expert and you can do a lot of jabbing in terms of producing content around the community um, while also dropping some tidbits about real estate. So top five neighborhoods and you're the best biking pass in Raleigh. Uh, things like that that you could create based on your interest as someone who likes to bike um, can really lead down that road. And that's a really good niche, not only for you, but for your people as well, because they're interested in it. It's good for you because you're interested. You're going to produce interesting content. Right. So I think one of the big traps here is when people do a niche group, they do something that they're trying to appeal to everybody. And when you try to appeal to everybody, you end up appealing to nobody. Right. You appeal to nobody. So um, pick your niche and just think of it in terms of you really just need a thousand raving fans. Right. Um, from that, you can build a really successful, strong, big business from that. So uh, get, get, don't be afraid to pick a niche and then back into it that way. Um, when you're thinking of things to do inside of a group, so uh, we'll stick with external right now and just talk community wise, you can really do a lot in there um, uh, around whatever the group's about. So say you create a real estate centric group and uh, you want to post content in there helping people find homes or maybe it's a, a home seller group or something along those lines. Um, documents and guides live in groups, right? You can almost create courses in groups now. Facebook has it set up that you can almost create a checklist when someone comes into your group, uh, kind of like a, a you could create for this is just me spitball in here something to uh, introduce them to your community. So if you have a relocation to your area group, uh, you can create guides for them inside of that group about the area. Check these things out. Here's the first five things you need to do. Um, but create content and you can post it in the files and it lives in that group forever. So anybody who joins it has access to that material. So you're building a good repository of content uh, for people that can go into your funnel. And then think webinars and seminars, right? You can broadcast that straight to the group and you know the topic they're interested in. And maybe you don't want to do the webinar or seminar. Maybe you don't want to be the one teaching or talking. Go, example, go back to our bike example. Go find one of the best bikers in your area or somebody who runs a club or maybe they run a bike shop. Bring them on, right? You're bringing content like that. It takes the pressure off of you to create something. You're still putting yourself in front of a big group of people. Um, that you get the opportunity to connect with. And uh, the, the, then you can also do the Facebook Lives in the groups um, and, and just kind of you know spitball questions, answer things. It's, it's a good way to get a litmus test of what people are interested in, uh, uh, answer questions for them along those lines. So uh, maximizing groups is, pretty, is a, is a pretty, pretty simple process of content creation. Use whatever you're using already um, and then put those into the groups. Uh, 
do you, do you want me to go into the, the client groups at all or are we gonna we would keep that in our back pocket? Uh, you can talk about that in just a second. I just wanted to draw your attention to something. I wasn't like sitting here reading the paper while you were talking. Uh, I saved this from the weekend, uh, sort of like my grandpa would do, I guess. Uh, this is this weekend's Wall Street Journal. And uh, as I was thumbing through it over the weekend, I, you won't be able to see this. However, this is a full page spread about Facebook groups. It's an ad from Facebook about the importance of groups. And this is on page A8 and A9. So it's like, you know, front section. And then I was like, wow, that really important. You saw in the, in the newsletter that I wrote on Monday, uh, I gave you guys a link out to the Super Bowl commercial they ran. So they took out a 60 minute spot during the Super Bowl about the importance of ads. And I thought, dang, so now they've got two full pages in the weekend journal and I turned to the next page and over here they have a whole other one right after it. So I'm only pointing that out to you to say when we're, when we're observant of what companies like this are doing, they will tell you what's important to them. This is evidence, the Super Bowl commercial is evidence that they see it's important and they want us interacting there. So let's just go play where they want us to play and then they handsomely reward us for doing that. Uh, so uh, anyway, I just wanted you to know I wasn't like reading the paper while you were talking. I have lots of good notes from today too. Um, sure, so you want, sure. you want to talk quickly about uh, client groups and, and uh, other ways to play that game and then we'll talk about CRMs and wrap up. Yeah, sure. Uh, so on client groups, the, the cool part about this is that you can kind of keep this hand in hand with the uh, the external groups as well. So thinking of lead conversion, people are saying, well, what, what else can I do if I have a group? Um, if you're posting good content, for example, uh, and there's no limit to the number of groups you can have. Now, don't go crazy and have 75, 80 groups. You can't manage them all, uh, but you can really do a lot of good things in five to six different groups. Um, and if you think of through your, through your clients, I, I would encourage you to start segmenting that right? And have, maybe you have a VIP client group that gets special access or um, they get, they get cool things in, in that, that VIP group. And then you have a group for all of the other leads in your world. That's what I would encourage you to do as well is go add people who are in your CRM, um, add them. If they were Facebook leads, add them to the group, throw them in the group. And maybe you create two branches, right? Maybe one is a buyer group and one is a seller group. So people who are interested in buying a home are able to see any webinars, seminars, documents, uh, presentations that you've done in there about how to buy a home. And anybody who's interested in selling a home can go into the other group. And maybe you have an investor group, maybe you have um, a property management group. There's different ways to build those out and add people in. Um, and then within your VIP client group, I, I like having different levels of groups just because you can kind of drive interaction a little bit. Um, so having a, a base client group where everybody's in, that's kind of like a system-wide announcement, right? You can send out stuff to everybody about anything going on in your world. You can announce listings in there. Um, people will start interacting with each other inside of those groups. And then your VIP group can be the one where you actually get to love on people a lot. You can do a lot of cool things in there, giveaways. Um, you could, uh, for example, have some type of prize program in your groups, like a referrer of the month. You can do coffee Mondays uh, uh, and then in fun engagement too. So throwback Thursdays, post a picture of your pets. Um, in my case, my pet is a two-year-old who was outside mowing the grass in a diaper today. So posting pictures of things like that makes it really personal for people um, uh, that, that will make it a lot more fun. And then it'll start organically growing. You can post quizzes in there, uh, but those, those are more about engagement and cultivation. And again, I go back to what we said at the beginning of this that it's all about being where your people already are. They're already on these social media sites. Um, they're already interacting in groups. The question is, are they going to interact in your group or someone else's group? And it's all about being top of mind. And this right now, I mean, in terms of exposure, it's just free exposure. I mean, Facebook's really pushing the ability for us to post something in a group and really blow it out of the water. Yeah, that's a great point. So I was looking at questions here and I do want to give you a heads up before I ask the next question. Uh, be on your best behavior. Your wife is here and watching. Hi, Laura. Um, so one of the questions is um, uh, texting platforms. What platform do you use or what platforms would you recommend that they look at? Uh, easiest one would be EZ text. That's the one we recommend to a lot of our clients. EZ text is how you spell it. Um, that, that's a mass texting platform. And then most of the CRMs that we play with have uh, texting inside of the CRM. So we'll send out texts. We can send mass texts to ours uh, through campaigns and things of that nature. Sure, perfect. 
All right, so let's transition and see the sort of home stretch here, 10 minutes or so left. And, and as you and I were prepping, you wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, CRMs and segmentation, and we're getting a lot of questions around that kind of thing. So take that wherever you'd like to, please. So we're going to do CRMs in 10 minutes or less. This is going that, to be good. That's it. That's it. Buckle up. Here we go. Fix the world's problems in 10 minutes or less. Got it. World peace right. coming, guys. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, uh, CRMs, is it's a big daddy question, right? It's the number one thing I hear about. Um, and again, it's just something we do cover in the digital marketing course, going through the type of CRMs. And again, I go back to people get really hung up on uh, the bells and whistles inside of a CRM. And really, we look for a few key things. But first, let's differentiate between the two main types of CRMs that, that we see. There's a database CRM, and then there is a lead generation CRM, right? Then they're, they're different. They're just different. So uh, a database CRM is more about nurturing right? You can jot that in your notes. A database CRM is about nurturing or cultivation of your clients. It does things at a deeper level than any other CRM. It will let you f have data on birthdays, anniversaries, as well as who referred who. It'll show you tracking records of all of that. Um, it'll let you put uh, additional fields on properties. It gives you a really robust contact record of someone. Um, whereas most lead generation CRMs, they're more focused on conversion of a lead right? That's the difference between the two. Database is literally for your database or cultivation. Lead generation is for producing inbound leads and converting them at a high level. Um, so that means their contact records are not as in-depth, but the tools they give you to convert leads are much, much more robust. So, uh, and, and I'll go back to this. At this point, there is not a single CRM that does both of these really well. I'm not saying there will never be. I'm just saying right now, I've touched just about every CRM on the market and I've been inside of a lot of the back ends of them. We've used them um, in our business and, and there's not one that does everything well. So if you're gonna look at a CRM with this idea of these are my, my uh, must haves, go in with that list and then really differentiate between the line of, is this a database must have or is this a, a, a lead generation must have if you're playing in that field? So. Um, key things that we look for on the uh, uh, the CRM on the lead gen side, just uh, basic stuff. So website with IDX. Again, doesn't have to be a beauty contest here. You want nice looking websites. At this point, like we said, most searches will come from um, they, they will come from Zillow, Realtor.com. That's just where they start it, or maybe even on Google they'll search. And you could win an SEO battle or a pay per click battle there. Not typically because they spend millions of dollars. You may spend hundreds of dollars. Different ball game. That being said, the, the reason we want a website with an IDX is lead nurture. We're not going to talk too much about that today, but that back end is really so that you can send them property updates and you need a website with an IDX future in it to be able to send people up to date properties that's branded to you, not to another team or another, another real estate agent or another outside company. The second key thing we look for is auto start plan. So uh, speed to lead is something we really talk about in terms of conversion. You have to be fast, right? And in today's world, there's no way to be as fast as an auto start plan so that when someone hits our system, they get a response through a text within five seconds of hitting our system. It's that fast now. So unless you're faster than that, you hear that within a second, I'll give it to you at that point. So uh, auto start plans are key. Third key thing is texting. We really look for texting and platforms now. It's pretty much our number one way that we start a conversation with somebody. Phone calls are still the best conversion method Having a conversation with someone on a phone is still the best way to get them to show up for an appointment. You really need to have the texting on the front end to create the conversations on the phone at some point. Uh, uh, fourth key thing is listing and market alerts. They are different, right? They are different. I'm not going to go into depth on this. Listings are more just what's on the market. Market reports actually give you an idea of what's going on in a certain neighborhood. Um, fifth key thing is integrations. Look for integrations with other things that you use. And again, this is so unique to each real estate individual or team or company um, that again, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on integrations here. It's just to tell you that if you're using say MailChimp for your email provider for your for your mass emails, and maybe you're using um, uh, uh, TC workflow for your transaction documents and you're using Dotloop or 
uh, some other e-signature platform, see what integrates with your platform as well as other marketing uh, avenues. If you're getting leads from Zillow, or Facebook, are there connections on those or not? Can those be dumped automatically into your system? And then once they're in your system, do those, do those integrations allow you to segment things out? Um, and there's uh, different tools as well, bomb bomb videos, uh, different things like that. So integrations are an important piece of it. And then the last thing is the mobile app. Uh, this used to be kind of an outlier. And really in the past three years, most platforms have a mobile app for you to download. It's really, really important. Need to have access to this um, remotely, uh, especially with your agents, people are managing leads in the field, or you want your agents to keep notes, or you're just trying to keep notes yourself as an individual agent, just trying to learn what the heck's going on. Uh, having a mobile app is key on the platform itself. So uh, overall, that's that's what we look for in a CRM at a very that's 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 not even a thirty thousand foot view. I would say that's like a 80, 90, maybe even a hundred thousand foot view of a CRM. Um, we can spend definitely days on this. I know there has been there have been robust debates throughout the years on what's the best CRM, um, and we're always happy to have that discussion. Just not today, because we we would be here till next year. Sure. Well, and so that was one of the questions that came in. So what I, I'm going to suggest that we could maybe offer to the group, if you're open to this, the question was uh, best lead generation CRMs or, you know, maybe like top five. And I know that's something that that we built out for the digital marketing course, a handful of best lead gen CRMs from your perspective and the pros and cons to them, a handful of best database related CRMs and the pros and cons to those. Uh, so you think we could put that together and post it in the group for folks as a little follow up item for them? I think that anybody who invites two or three other people to the group will get that message to them. That seems fair. Go. Yeah, yeah, that seems fair. Help us grow the group. Yeah. There we go, grow the group guys. Yeah, yeah, I like that plan. Uh, ben, anything else, parting shots that you have for the folks today? Uh, I, I think the last thing for today is, is and this is, this is related to your metrics overall, but focus on the right things, guys. Uh, whatever you're doing right now, focus on the right things and, and just, just looking at the metrics of all this stuff. Too many people are getting hung up on, uh, did 50 people view my video and not 17,000 people view my video or my video production is not as good as this other person's. Don't, don't get hung up on that stuff. Think of it in terms of if you had to go out and talk to 170 or 300 people, how long would that take you? Um, and that's why doing a video of any type and getting that type of interaction, whether it's five people, 10 people, 15 people, those are people engaging with your content, right? And Facebook's going to notice and put it in front of other people on their feed. So um, don't get hung up, focus on the right things. And you can take that in a much bigger sense as well. Focus on the right things right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great point. It ties nicely to something that you, you and I've been working together for a while and, and you know this and Debbie and I talk about it frequently. My favorite phrase on something like this is just get incrementally better every day doesn't have to be leaps and bounds. Just put one foot in front of the other. We started doing all this stuff. What now we're in our sixth week of doing this. And candidly, six or seven weeks ago, we we're like, uh, we don't know how this is going to work out. Like, we don't exactly know what we're doing and the distribution of all this stuff to you folks. What we did know is that Ben had some great valuable information to share on this and that the Thought Leader Friday would be valuable. And we look up six weeks from now and we can legit say that we're a lot better at this now than we were six weeks ago. And six weeks from now, we'll be able to say the same thing. And you will be as well. You've got to get started. And you got to get focused on incrementally better every day. Ben, great job today as always. Thanks everybody for being here. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Uh, this Friday, we will not be doing Thought Leader Friday because we're doing a private event uh, for our clients and their team members only a uh, facilitated virtual mastermind where we bring in an outside facilitator who does this for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so if you want to be a part of it and you're not a client, you could join us in the next two days and see you there. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you back here next Wednesday uh, for Digital Marketing Wednesday or tomorrow for Live Music Happy Hour at 5 p.m. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye, guys.